friendly neighborhood immunologist here. And today I thought we'd talk about how scientific papers get published. It takes a really long time. In fact, getting a paper published in about two years would be a really fast paper. I think typically it takes three to four years, but it could take up to seven years, maybe even 10 years if you're doing a really long longitudinal study where you're following patients. So what does it take? There's seven main things. There is basically step one, <laughs> take years to acquire a skill. The skill could be using a pipette, it could be handling animals, it could be slicing tissue, it could be working with a computational model system, but either way, it takes years. The first year I ran ELISA's, the first year I did flow cytometry, I don't think any of my data ended up getting published because you just need that time to hone your skills. You need to run it by other people in the lab. Yeah, it takes a while. So step one is take years to get a skill. Step two is to work with a model system. The choices are cells, so cells in a dish, that's called cell culture. There's computational models, there's animals, insects, um, so mice and rats and flies are pretty common model systems because they do share some features with the human immune system, the human nervous system. There's also zebrafish. They're helpful if people want to watch cells move in real time because they're more or less transparent and a lot of microscopes can actually see right through them. Or you could be working with human samples. So human blood tissue, human tissue samples after a surgery, those are all good options. So after that, you need to set up your experiment, your controls and collect your data. And then you have to do it again. And then you have to do it again. <laughs> and depending on whether or not the data looks the same each time, you may have to continue doing the data until you have a consensus, until it all matches up. Then you have to start writing. If you're really ambitious, you can start writing up your data as you're going through the process. So you need to write it up you need to do statistics to see if anything you found is likely to be a real biological phenomenon. If there's no statistical significance, what you found could be important, but it could also have happened due to chance. So the better your statistics look, the more likely you found a real biological phenomenon. And then you need to edit your paper. Hopefully you'll have a nice couple of people in lab who will help you do that. Your boss needs to edit the paper, that can take a minute. And then you need to have references, which means you need to have read between 60 and 80 papers within your very small field. And you need to talk about them and compare your paper to what's already out there in the field. And then when that's done, that could already have taken three years. And then you need to send it to a journal, so a scientific journal and the editor will get your request. You write up a cover letter, you tell them the top three hot things that you found that nobody has published before, and the editor either accepts or rejects. So I've had papers accepted. I've also had papers rejected. The editors typically know whether or not you're going to push forward the field of science in whatever niche field you're working on. Uh, you can actually look at something called the impact factor of a journal. So there are more impactful places like nature and science, and they have an impact factor between like 20 and 40. And what that means is every year, 20 to 40 people will cite a paper in that journal, meaning that's how much impact it has on the scientific field because other people are using it to base up their next research project on. Um, so that's how much it impacts the field. So an impact factor of two is on the lower side, seven to 15 is right in the middle. Uh, yeah. And then the editor needs to send it to two reviewers. There are two to three reviewers per paper, and they have to be in a very, very similar field. So they have to be, you know, if I studied liver cancer and T cells, they could study brain cancer and T cells, but they try to get somebody else who literally studies liver cancer and T cells. So you could branch out a little bit. You could be, yeah, T cells and lymph node cancer, things like that would be appropriate. But typically the reviewers have to be very closely associated to your field. There is a little bit of 
interesting things here. You can, there's a drop down menu when you try to get a research paper published and it says names you'd like to recommend and names you would like to reject. And it might sound like you can game the system a little, but it's there for a good reason. So if you're a new scientist, it's really helpful to have a friend take a look at your paper. So the editor chooses, even if you put forward a couple of names out of two to three reviewers, the editor could choose one. You're not gonna get a magical friends list, but it does help somebody early in their career. And the names of places not to send are competitors typically. So if somebody is working on almost the exact same thing, if they see your paper, before it's published, they might steal some of your ideas. They might intentionally be harsh. These things rarely happen. Most people don't need this list at all. But if you've been working in a field for 40 years, over time, you're going to know whether or not other researchers are going to be respectful of your research. And yeah, every once in a while, you will have somebody on that list, but it's not very common. So number six is, did the reviewers accept your paper or not? So they can accept it, which is fantastic, pop the champagne, reject it, which is sad, which means you probably need to take it to another journal, to another editor, go through the process again. That could have taken six months out of your life. And then the most common option is accepted with revisions, meaning the reviewers gave you more work to do, more experiments. If you work on a computer model, this could take you two months. If you work with animals, this could take you six months to two years. So now here we are at year four or four and a half. And then you have to do those experiments and you have to show them to the reviewers. They don't have to show up in the paper itself, but you have to show three other scientists that you did it and what the results are and whether or not you're gonna put them in your main paper. All right, and then once you've done that, you have to send it back to those same exact reviewers and most of the time, when you put in this much effort, you will get the magical words accepted and you will be able to publish. All right, so where does the money come from? The money to do all of this can come from a lot of different places and it depends on where you are in the process. If you are a newbie, a graduate student, that's somebody who has just begun the research process and they're on their way to getting a PhD. So the money there is coming from your boss. Your boss is called a PI or principal investigator. Now where they get their money from is probably a combination of the college or university that they work at, a government grant that they wrote up a lot of research for, and it is competitive, and other people in your field will rank them, and then the top 10 to 15% or so will get government money. It's very, very competitive. And you almost never get it on the first try. You have to keep trying. It's definitely something about science. You have to keep revising your hypothesis and trying again and again. And getting up when you get knocked down. Um, so in addition to that, it could be a private grant. So the Michael J. Fox Foundation is an example of a private grant. There's um, private grants in Canada, like the Weston Brain Institute. So you could get it from a private company. It doesn't have to be governmental or uh, university money. All right, so now I'm gonna show you some of my reviewer comments and see whether or not they're worse than the average YouTube comment section. All right, so here are some of my actual comments on a paper that I submitted to Scientific Reports. It was eventually accepted after um, some revisions. So you can see here, revision number three, they are talking about some of my data found in a certain brain region. And then they ask me to do the same thing in a different brain region. But the way that they ask for it is really very reasonable. And then you can see in the response, I basically tell them, oh, what you've asked for is a reasonable request, but somebody has already done this and published it. So I just cite the other paper and that saves me from doing the work. Now, question number four, they asked very straightforwardly for more work. There's a test called an ELISA to measure amyloid beta in the rodent brains. And I did it in one form, but not the others. So they asked me to complete it in the other form. And so I did. I think that they were pretty polite and straightforward. And that was a good reviewer comment on both three and four. Okay, so here is another comment from the same reviewer. Uh, in fact, when we did this, often you never find out who the reviewers are. But I think that this person was very fair. 
They brought up the fact that in the discussion, which is the last part of the paper where you say what you found and you apply it to the future, that we overstated our conclusions. We were saying that this drug that we use had a direct effect on neurons because of some work we did in a cell culture in a dish. But they reminded us that we needed to actually soften our language because we didn't prove without a shadow of a doubt that this was happening specifically in neurons. So that was another good comment. Okay, so this comment was a little bit harsher. I'm just going to read the part to you that is the most relevant. They said in a perfect world, the anatomical effects of the current manipulations would track closely with behavioral results. Yes, that would be ideal. However, the data tell a different story. The lack of agreement between the anatomical and behavioral data could be explained by procedural factors. That's a slam, by the way. They're saying it's something we could have done by not being very good at the techniques. As noted by the reviewer, my inexperience with the specific anatomical measurements made in the current design limit my ability to comment with the authority on these procedure matters, although the authors appeared to respond appropriately in their rebuttal. We had already responded to one of their comments. If the validity of the anatomical measurements is accepted, the results indicate that neither neuron loss nor glial proliferation as assessed in the study can account for the reported behavioral differences. Although undoubtedly surprising and somewhat disappointing, these findings still provide insight regarding the mechanisms by which a hormone and the neurotoxic insult may exert their effects on spatial memory. So that's about as harsh as it can get. They acknowledged that we worked hard, we responded to them, but that some of our results were surprising, if not disappointing. So this reviewer was a little bit saucier than the uh, previous one. Here, they also did a little bit of a slam. Um, they say that the neuropathology underlying Alzheimer's disease is likely multifaceted, despite attempts of many researchers to distill the cause down to one or two primary neuroanatomical abnormalities, such as elevated forms of plaques and tangles. If the explanation were that simple, we would have effective treatments by now. Again, saucy. The authors would be careful about describing the manipulation as a reflection of Alzheimer's disease pathology, when at best their approach may be targeting only a part of the problem. So they wanted us to change our language in the introduction, and we said yes. The human Alzheimer's is incredibly complex, and to address the issue, we have mentioned tau tangles are not present in our model and changed the language in the discussion section from AD pathology to amyloid injection, which is more specific for our paper. So there you have it. Sometimes you get nice requests that are very detailed. Sometimes you get requests that are reasonable, if not snarky. But overall, the process is very stringent. It's the best way to get real, repeatable science out there is to have other experts grill you, more or less. And that's how we do our best science is as a community. All right, so that's it for this video. Please let me know in the comment section if you have any questions about research publications. To be fair, medical publications are a little bit different. They could be about a single person, which is called a case study, or a small group of people, and those can be published a little bit faster. But in general, if you're reading a paper, three to five years worth of blood, sweat, tears, skills, editing, re-editing, you know, bouncing things back and forth to reviewers, you know, just to get you to appreciate what it's like to put all that work in when you are reading papers off of PubMed, and then hopefully that'll help you compare real research to what might occasionally be presented in the news. All right, uh, I got another video coming out this week on antibody-dependent enhancement, and I hope you all have a great week. Stay healthy. Bye.